Can somebody? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Alex. Was that you? Yes. Hey, Elon. Okay. Hi. Hey, everyone. Okay. So welcome to session eight of ITCS. And hi, it's Vika. Okay. Okay. Recording started. Great. Um, okay. So we're at session eight. Um, this is, again, this is gonna be a session of short talks. ITCS has this tradition where usually the session chair gives some overview of the papers. Um, we have a very short session. It's one hour for five papers. So I'm not gonna talk a lot. I'm really gonna like talk 10 seconds about each paper, okay? Just to make sure that everybody's uh, here and intrigued and, and stay for the entire session. Um, uh, and then we'll have a 10 minute talk by each author, uh, including questions and uh, some two, three minutes for, uh, for buffer time. Um, okay, so we have five papers and the first paper, uh, I'm not gonna say all the authors, but it's gonna be interactive, uh, interaction preserver compilers for circuit computation. And uh, for each paper, I try to ask a question, which what is the question that the paper asks in a kind of language that maybe the author of the paper didn't, you know, allow themselves to ask. Okay, but I can do this for them. So really they ask here, I think this is a question actually they do write in the paper in this example, but what is the price of security? I think this is like a great premise for a paper, a great question. Okay, we want security, but at what uh, price? I actually have one paper where I uh, ask the same question. And you can ask this in many different contexts. And here they say, okay, we have some a, a protocol that allows me to compute something in a non-secure manner, okay? And this protocol has uh, some communication complexity. And now what is the price of taking this, uh, this protocol and making sure that it's secure? Okay, and it's secure in the MPC, uh, in the, in the MPC sense. Okay, so this is paper number one. Um, I think Justin is gonna present this paper if I remember correctly. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so um, paper number two. Uh, so we have one uh, MPC paper, two encryption papers and two hash uh, function papers. So this is the hash function paper. Uh, locality preserving hashing for shifts, okay? With connections to cryptography. And uh, this is a very nice uh, premise of the hash functions that uh, maintain some uh, locality property. Uh, and this allows you to do something like encrypt a message such that only people that are near you um, uh, can decrypt the message. Or the way I like to put it is like, in, what is an encryption? Encryption uh, is something that crypto allows you to simulate uh, a, a box with a, you know, with a key and a lock, right? So this is physically what we think of, and this is um, 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 what crypto allows us to do mathematically. And here the question is, can crypto mathematically implement whispering? Okay, can it implement that I whisper something and only somebody, somebody near me can hear it? Okay, so this is uh, paper number two. Uh, the third uh, paper is a, a pre-constrained uh, encryption. Uh, ah, the second paper, I think Ohad is talking, right? Uh, yeah, I saw him uh, yes. before, okay. Uh, Pre-constrained encryption. Um, so this is one of the uh, encryption papers that, that say, talk about this setting of encryption, which we have a, a master key and then we have uh, other keys. Uh, okay, maybe functional encryption, I think is uh, one uh, good example. We have a master key, but then I can derive, uh, you know, secondary keys that can only decrypt uh, for some function. And the uh, question here really uh, is, do I trust the person with the master key? Or maybe do not do I trust, and how can I, you know, reduce the trust, the, the, the trust that I need to give to somebody that contains the master key? Okay, so how, how can I do some, something that's pre-constrained even for the master key? Okay, and this is really reduces the power of the setup phase. And uh, I think this is a very, very important. And I believe Prabhanjam will be giving the talk. I didn't see him, see him here before. 
Um, okay. Uh, the fourth um, paper is Lattice Inspired Broadcast Encryption, okay, and succinct, succinct ciphertext policy ABE. Um, so, um, I start speaker here is going to give the talk. Uh, so, broadcast encryption is this very, very nice primitive where you want to encrypt a message. Okay, and there's a big audience. Every audience has a public and private key. And I want some subpopulation, so some subset of the of the audience to, to get my message. And uh, the question is, how can I do this efficiently? And um, it's very easy to do this inefficiently if I just encrypt every person, you know, I just double my encryption, uh, you know, for every person uh, separately. Um, but of course, we don't want to do that. And uh, there's a long line of works, but essentially all these works do not get post-quantum security, um, maybe except for obfuscation, I think, I'm not sure. Um, but in particular, they're not lattice-based. And uh, you could ask, well, what does the quantum physics have against broadcast encryption? Okay, why do quantum physics, they really don't allow us <laughs> to do this broadcast in encryption. And even after you see Vika's talk, you'll see that um, the problem is really uh, far from uh, being, being solved. And actually, I think this is uh, uh, very interesting. Um, the last paper uh, is about correlation intractable hash functions via shift hiding. So um, this is another paper in a long line of papers that are trying to implement correlation intractable hash functions mainly for the purpose of uh, doing a uh, Fiat Shamir. Okay, so we want to do this uh, Fiat Shamir uh, paradigm, uh, but we don't want to assume a random oracle. Okay, so if we have a random oracle, we put pretty much know uh, uh, for what protocols we can apply the Fiat Shamir transform. Uh, but we want to do this like with a concrete, uh, you know, hash function that we can implement under some standard assumption. And really, uh, I like all these works because they really, are asking, you know, can we bridge this big gap between the concrete hash functions that we have and random oracles? And I think this is like a very nice research uh, direction and uh, every progress, you know, from this end and every progress from this end getting us closer and closer together. And uh, one day maybe we'll understand like, you know, exactly what properties we need for every application that allows us to you know, replace the random work. Uh, okay, so that's the, the last talk. With no further ado, uh, we'll start with the first talk with uh, Justin. Justin, you're uh, welcome to share. Okay. All right, thank you for the uh, nice introduction and for um, giving just kind of a brief summary of what this talk is about. So in this talk, we're worried about secure compu uh, multi-party computation where the parties all provide a private input and then get the output. The security guarantee we want, of course, is that no input or no information about the input is revealed except for the output. We're also concerned with the setting uh, where all but one party can be corrupted. There's been a lot of work on over the years on optimizing the communication complexity of secure computation. Yao's original garbled circuit construction scales with the size of both inputs. Recently, uh, works have studied Alice or Bob optimized protocols, which have a communication which is independent of one party's input. Uh, however, these are only limited to two party computation protocols, though they are constant around protocols. Another approach uh, to minimizing communication complexity is to compile an insecure protocol into a secure protocol using fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, the communication ends up being proportional to the communication of the insecure protocol, but incurs a multiplicative polynomial blow up in the security parameter lambda. And for certain uh, computations, the communication can then be independent of both inputs, depending on the insecure protocol being compiled. Um, Another downside of this approach is that it adds two additional rounds. In this work, 
we're focused on optimizing that second approach and trying to be able to remove the multiplicative communication blow up as well as the extra rounds. Our end goal is to be able to lift results from the communication complexity literature directly into the secure computation setting without paying a significant price in terms of interaction. Of course, not all functions can be computed using less communication than the size of the inputs. However, a, a rich class of functions can be. For example, let's consider two chess playing AIs. The AIs themselves might be quite large, but playing chess only requires communicating the next move. Uh, and this example, of course, naturally extends to other combinatorial games. There are many of more examples which can also be found in the communication complexity literature. Uh, for our first result, we start by considering semi-honest adversaries in the common reference string model. Semi-honest adversaries follow the protocol, uh, but try to learn extra information by examining the messages. And in the common reference string model, uh, parties start with a string, which is sampled by a trusted party. Assuming the hardness of circular learning with errors, we achieve a communication complexity, which is asymptotically the communication complexity of the insecure protocol being compiled, plus some additional overhead terms. Uh, you might notice that we do incur a polynomial blow up with respect to the security parameter lambda in terms of the last message, depth of the output circuit, and size of the output, uh, overcoming this uh, overhead without adding ad additional rounds has been shown to require some form of program obfuscation. For the case of two parties, uh, our compiler is perfectly round preserving, but for the case, more general case of M parties, uh, we do have to add an additional round. However, by additionally assuming extractable witness encryption and succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge, uh, we can get around this extra round uh, and get a perfect round preserving compiler, even for the um, more general multi-party case. This does come at a slight cost to the communication overhead. Once we've answered these two questions, uh, a natural next question is whether or not we can lift these results into the plain model and get security against malicious adversaries. Uh, we show the answer to this to be yes, if we additionally assume simulation extractable snarks. Um, this does incur a polynomial blow up in the size of the second message, but no other blow up, uh, no other message is blown up this way. Uh, additionally, due to some lower bound for the setting, the protocol takes a minimum of four rounds. At the heart of our communication improvements is a construction of rate one multi-key fully homomorphic encryption, which was not previously known. Uh, and as a building block, we also construct rate one multi-key linearly homomorphic encryption. The multi-key property allows parties to merge their keys instead of computing one master secret key as in a uh, normal fully homomorphic encryption based compiler. Avoiding this extra computation saves a few rounds. The rate one property ensures that the encrypted messages have roughly the same size as the ciphertext messages, so that the encrypted protocol does not get significantly become significantly larger. For the last few minutes of the talk, uh, I'm going to give a high-level overview of our rate one multi-key linearly homomorphic encryption construction, since that's a major stepping stone on the way to rate one multi-key fully homomorphic encryption. Our starting point is Regev's encryption scheme, which is modified to pack many messages into a single ciphertext. Uh, the slide, of course, is missing many details since there's not much time, but the important bits are that the messages are represented as a vector. The secret key consists of a matrix S. The ciphertext consists of two components, C1 and C2. And decryption is linear, where we take the second ciphertext component minus S times the first ciphertext component. The first step to achieving rate one multi-key linearly homomorphic encryption, of course, is to enable the multi-key aspect. The general idea behind uh, enabling linear evaluations on ciphertexts, which are encrypted under different secret keys, is to keep the first component of each ciphertext uh, and then combine the second components. Then we can do decryption similarly to the original process, simply by pairing the first components with their respective secret keys. Now, you might notice that uh, this does increase the size of the ciphertext. Evaluated ciphertexts will scale with the number of keys involved. Uh, however, if you keep the number of keys the same, you can combine arbitrarily many ciphertexts under those keys. 
uh, without increasing the message size. Um, in order to achieve rate one, even with this handicap, we observe that a larger message space amortizes the cost of computing on more keys. This is particularly useful when we're compiling protocols whose messages scale in size with the number of parties involved. The second tool that we're going to use uh, in order to achieve rate one is a ciphertext compression algorithm uh, from Bukursky et al., which crucially relies on the linear decryption process of the multi-key linearly homomorphic encryption. Then to achieve rate one, we combine both of these uh, tools with some careful parameter choices. If you found this talk interesting, please check out the full version. And thanks for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Justin. Uh, we have like a minute for questions. Any questions? Okay, so Justin, thank you again. And we'll just move on to the second talk. Um, okay, so uh, Ohad, are you giving the talk? Yeah. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and okay. you're on. Great. Uh, so the story begins when Alice and Bob got, get to New York and they want to meet up. We all know that it might be a ch challenging task to find each other. So one solution to the problem is if Alice and Bob seek for the Statue of Liberty, find the relative locations to, to the statue and, uh, and then they can compute the relative location by subtracting the, the two vectors. Now, this solution is, uh, of finding each other has two problems. First, we do not always have a notable object such as the Statue of Liberty. And second, even if we do have such a notable object, it takes a linear time to find it. So we seek for a general and efficient method for communicating relative locations of two people. For this, we introduced the concept of locality preserving hashing for shifts or LPHS in short which roughly speaking is uh, we are given a, a string or two dimensional string in the, in, in the previous context and you need to find a distinguished location inside this, uh, this string or this map. So we say that a function H from strings to locations is a D delta LPHS if H makes reads uh, D bits from the input. And moreover, if, uh, if the probability is that uh, H on a string does not equal to uh, the H of the string shifted by one, uh, plus one is smaller than Delta. That is the probability that uh, the uh, distinguished location is not the same in X and its shifted variant is small. Uh, this definition has several variants. For example, you may ask why, uh, why we consider a, an average input X. Why not insist that for every input we have that, uh, uh, we, find, uh, we find the distinguished location inside this input. So in the paper, we show that, uh, that, uh, that we can implement a worst case uh, LPHS using an average case LPHS. Uh, so for simplicity in this talk, we assume a random string X. Moreover, there is the, uh, I didn't specify whether the shifts are cyclic or, uh, or, or, or the shifts are acyclic. That is, uh, we take the string, uh, chop one bit from, uh, from one of the sides and insert a new bit. Uh, again, the two variants are, uh, are simi similar. And uh, in this talk, we are going to assume 
as I click shifts. And moreover, uh, in the previous slide, we discussed one dimensional LPHS. Uh, and we can also uh, define a two dimensional LPHS in which we want that uh, the, the shifting property we want both when we shift our uh, uh, map or string uh, uh, to uh, downwards or to, uh, or to the sides. So you mean the input is a matrix and you, you move all the rows? The, yes. In the same way? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Uh, okay. So there are several applications to uh, good constructions of LPHAs, which we show in the paper. Uh, the, our first application in, uh, is algorithmic. In this, uh, in this setting, we are given several input strings uh, in pre process time. And then uh, after pre-processing them, we were given one string at a time, and we need to find the closest string in our uh, uh, in the in the pre-processed uh, string that is closest to it in, in inside the shift metric. Of course, there are strings that are not. Uh, they are not uh, even a shift of our string, so uh, they are not an option. Um, okay, so this is the first application. For uh, another application is location sensitive encryption. In here, uh, roughly speaking, we show how we can build a method to encrypt uh, messages so that only uh, people which are physically close to us will be able to, dec to decrypt. This is the second application. And uh, another application is to homomorphic secret sharing. Uh, so homomorphic secret sharing allows many, uh, solving many problems. Uh, and, and one thing about it that it, it, it usually have a low communication complexity. Uh, so we show how we, uh, how by using a high dimensional LPHS, uh, say two dimensional LPHS, we can get even uh, less communication in, in, in protocols uh, using homomorphic sec secret sharing. Uh, so these are the applications. And now uh, let us talk how we build uh, efficient LPHS. So one solution to the problem is the Statue of Liberty uh, solution we, we have seen earlier. So in this solution, we just uh, seek for uh, this, we read the, uh, say, d bits from the input and find uh, the most special uh, substring uh, in, in what we read. So for example, we may search for the largest streak of zeros and uh, and output uh, this location. So this is a valid LPHS, but we want a better LPHS. Uh, for this- so yes. how Can I ask a question? So uh, maybe I course. missed something, maybe I missed something, but don't you need some other property of this hash function to make it non-trivial? Some, is it pseudo-random or uh, is uh, it- uh, uh, you, other, you can, otherwise, uh, otherwise, like the constant zero function will just. Uh, uh, so, so we want to uh, identify a location inside our string. Uh, so, and we want that after shifting uh, our string uh, by say one, then we will stop on the same location. If you always output uh, the zero location, you will end up on two different places because uh, one of the places is shifted. I understand, but I didn't see that in the definition you gave there. Uh, uh, but okay, maybe I'll wait. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I want to introduce a magic trick uh, that uh, uh, gives the, the essence of uh, the cons our construction. 
So you should uh, pick uh, one card at the top row and then advance by the number on the car, card that you see. So if you choose the three on the top row, then you should count three cards and uh, repeat this uh, procedure. Um, now, uh, now we can do this, but uh, I will tell you that every, uh, no matter what card you pick, you will always end up at, uh, at this location at, at the uh, last row. Um, so, uh, so this is a magic trick and the relation to LPHS is that that we found it that we find a distinguished location inside our string of cards by reading only a few uh, by looking at only a few cards. So this is the essence of the uh, of our construction. And in the paper, we show uh, both a, a good construction and also a, a, a construction that, that uh, we conjecture to be optimal. And we prove the optimality of, uh, of our conjectured optimal um, construction. And just uh, two, op two open problems. So first, uh, the first obvious open problem is to prove that our uh, two-dimensional LPHS that we construct is indeed optimal. Uh, we can we didn't manage to rigorously uh, prove it and moreover if, if you go to higher dimensions then we do not know to construct uh, nearly optimal lphs uh, this is related to that that uh, two random walks in uh, five dimensions uh, are unlikely to collide uh, thank you okay thank you Ad. thank you very much any other questions we have uh... One minute. Um, maybe I also say you didn't mention the authors, so I want to mention them. So this is with Led Boy, Litay Binur, Mid Gilboy, Uvali Shai, and Nathan Keller. So any other questions? Okay. Did I miss something in the chat? No. Okay. So the next next speaker, Prabanjam, uh, is that you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't know who the speakers are, and I'm just <laughs> guessing uh, by the authors. Um, uh, okay. So, Prabhanjan, uh, yeah. So, you can introduce the co authors and then the stage is yours. Great. Um, so, hey, everyone, I'm going to talk about pre constrained encryption. This is in joint work with uh, Abhishek Jain, uh, Cheng Zhong Jin, and Julia Malavolta. Um, so, this this talk is about end-to-end -end encryption systems. Um, so we, in end-to-end -end encryption systems, we have uh, every pair of users having a decryption key associated with them. They transmit ciphertext on some platform owned by some organization. Um, so the question is, you know, the users use these secret keys, who generates the secret key? Um, so there are two options, either the user could generate the secret key or the organization could generate the secret key, right? So it turns out that there are issues with either the user generating the secret key or the organization generating the secret key. So let's look at the issues. So if the user generates the secret key, then the you know law enforcement agencies might not have access to the encrypted data. Um, so for example, let's say this user is suspected of some criminal activity and they need the encrypted data to um, file charges against this individual, then, uh, then they won't be able to do so. So another issue is that, uh, you know, let's say the encrypted data is stored on the cloud and the server wants to do some computation on it and sort of recover the answer, um, then it's unclear how to accomplish this uh, in a non-interactive manner, right? So it makes the whole computing on encrypted data more interactive. On the other hand, you can think maybe like the organization generates a secret key, but the problem is that this uh, makes it vulnerable to data breach attacks. Um, so a bunch of hackers could sort of hack into the servers and steal all the user keys. Uh, another issue is that, you know, uh, maybe the law enforcement uh, agencies could force the organization to sort of reveal the secret keys and perhaps use this to conduct mass surveillance. 
Um, so this has led to the encryption debate where we have on the one hand, um, users and privacy advocates um, advocating for the fact that we need end-to-end -end encryption. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, you know senators, congressmen and women and law enforcement officials who want to abolish end-to-end -end encryption. So the question is, you know, is there a middle ground? Can we come up with a solution that can sort of satisfy both these uh, different groups? So towards addressing this very, very complex issue, we're going to take a baby step. Uh, we're going to uh, propose the notion called pre-constrained encryption. Um, so in pre-constrained encryption, it's the authority who's going to generate the secret key, except that the secret key is going to have very limited decryption power. Uh, so meaning that it can only recover some very restricted uh, amount of information about the underlying message. So, so what does this restricted information mean? So uh, let me take an example. Suppose let's say the encrypted, the message being encrypted contains some, some potentially incriminating uh, content. Let's say it says, let's rob a bank. Then using the secret key should be able to recover and see what this message is. On the other hand, if it contains something innocuous like I'm attending ITCS, then you should not be able to sort of decrypt and recover uh, what the message contains. Um, and one important point I want to mention here is that there is no assumption on the authority being honest. Uh, so the authority could be generating the secret key however it wants. And we want the, the generated secret key to still have limited decryption power, even if, it's, if, even if it is generated maliciously. Okay, so let's look at the formal definition. Um, so in the definition, we have the setup algorithm that takes as input a constraint circuit, C. Uh, I'm going to talk about what this is. And it outputs a secret key and a public key. So what is this constraint circuit C? Um, so this circuit C sort of partitions the class of all functions uh, into two categories. In the one category, we have the authorized set. Uh, these are all the functions uh, such that the output of the constraint circuit on these functions gives one as the output. Uh, and the, on the other category is called the unauthorized set. So um, we should think of the authorized set as follows. Uh, given the decryption key, uh, anyone can recover uh, a function of the encrypted message uh, for, for any function in this authorized set. Okay. So, and for all the functions that are in the unauthorized set, you should not be able to sort of recover the output of the function on the message. Okay, so some classes of functions that you can consider is, you know, these functions, you know, there's, there are broadly two categories that you can consider. Uh, in one category, you can have uh, the functions deciding whether the input contains some objectionable material, Maybe it could contain some, um, you know, it sort of outputs one if the input contains some commonly used code words by criminals, or it could contain some illicit material, like it can classify whether the underlying message contains it or not. Right? In the other category, yeah, you know, maybe the input is like a, an email message and the, uh, the function sort of classifies whether it is spam or not. So let's go back to the definition. So we have the setup that outputs the secret key in the public key. Then you have the encryption algorithm. This is the standard. And in the decryption algorithm, in, in, in addition to the decryption key, uh, you also take as input uh, ciphertext and the function f. Uh, and the output of the decryption algorithm should be f of x, uh, if and only if f is authorized. Uh, in other words, the output of the constraint circuit on f outputs one. Okay. So one very useful feature to have uh, is, is the key delegation feature. So uh, we can append the sort of algorithms that I mentioned in the previous slide with uh, an algorithm called key generation algorithm that takes as input uh, a secret key and, and also the function and outputs a functional key associated with F. This is similar to uh, the key generation algorithm you, you might have encountered in the advanced encryption systems. And the decryption algorithm now takes as input like a functional key and this, uh, the ciphertext and outputs f of x, um, where f is authorized. So we want this uh, pre-constrained encryption system to satisfy three properties. So one is correctness, um, should be able to recover f of x as long as f is authorized. And the second property is uh, security against authority, uh, which says that you know even if the authority has the setup randomness, even if it has a secret, key should not be able to recover f of x for any unauthorized f. And finally, we have the constraint heading property uh, that says that the public key should not reveal any information about the constraint circuit C. 
So uh, we have a bunch of results in the paper. So I'm sort of going to summarize it uh, at a high level now. Uh, so we give a, a set of definitions for pre-constrained encryptions and we give uh, security compilers. Uh, so we first uh, look at pre-constrained encryption satisfying something called a semi-malicious security and we show how to sort of boost it to malicious security uh, using a generic compiler, uh, by proposing a generic compiler. And then we give constructions of special cases of uh, pre-constrained encryption from learning with errors. Um, and then like we show that the most general case of pre-constrained encryption is as powerful as IO. And even some special cases such as like attribute pre-constrained encryption implies uh, witness encryption. Okay. So for the rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to look at the special case, which is attribute based pre-constrained encryption uh, for point constraints. Um, so these are the two terms I haven't uh, defined. So let me go and let me do that. So um, attribute pre-constrained encryption, um, you know, is associated with the class of functions that you would encounter in an attribute-based encryption scheme. Um, so, so every function um, is, is, is uh, parameterized by another function, let me call that T. It takes as input X and M and outputs M if and only if the parameterized function G on X outputs zero. Okay. Um, and by point constraint, what I mean is that uh, the constraint circuit is parameterized by an input X star. Uh, and the author authorized set consists of all the functions that output one on X star. Okay, so it's a very specific class of constraints. Okay, so let's see how to construct this. Uh, so here is the main insight. We observe that the there are advanced encryption systems in the crypto literature uh, with a very special security proof structure. And we are going to look at this very specific proof structure and we will show how to sort of convert that into a construction of pre-constrained encryption. Okay, so in more detail, you know, we have this selective uh, security proof, which of the structure where the challenger, where the adversary needs to declare the challenge message uh, ahead of time. And then the challenger gives the public key and then the adversary can make a bunch of uh, key queries. So in, in some security proofs, uh, you reach a hybrid experiment uh, where the challenge, challenger uh, computes a fake public key and a fake secret key in such a way that the fake secret key cannot issues for or cannot issue keys for inadmissible functions. So what is inadmissible depends on the specific uh, notion of advanced encryption system that you consider. Um, so in our context, you should think of uh, uh, inadmissible functions as unauthorized functions. So using this, uh, here is a template to construct uh, pre-constrained encryption. The setup algorithm takes as input uh, point, point x star, and it outputs the fake secret key in the public key. Um, and the key generation algorithm can issue keys if and only if uh, f is admissible or authorized. Right? So even if, if f is unauthorized, then even if it wants to, it won't be able to generate a key for it. Um, and we show how to construct this uh, by looking at the proof structure of uh, attribute-based encryption scheme by Bone et al. So I, I won't have a lot of time to go into the details of the construction. So I'm going to skip the details. Yeah, you need to wrap, wrap up. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, there, are, this is still a uh, nascent area and there are a lot of interesting questions. Um, so one natural question is whether, you know, there are many advanced encryption systems on the literature, can we look at the different selective security proofs they have and convert that into PC constructions? We need to still understand the relationship of uh, pre-constrained encryption with advanced encryption systems better. Um, also identify interesting class of const constraints based on uh, the different applications of uh, PC. So this I conclude. Okay, thank you, Pabanjan. Uh, we don't really have time for questions, except if somebody has like a really nice question. I'm giving three seconds, two, one, okay. Um, so the next talk is uh, Tzvika. You're uh, welcome to uh, share your screen. Yeah. Tzvika is gonna tell us about broadcast encryption. All right. And uh, why we can and cannot achieve it. Great, uh, are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Excellent, good. So I'm going to talk about Lattice-inspired broadcast encryption in 16 ciphertext policy ABE, and this is joint work with Vinod Venkatanathan. Uh, let me start by briefly saying what broadcast encryption is. So um, we're thinking about a content provider and it wants to 
provide content to many users, so capital end users, and um, not all the content is supposed to be uh, visible to all the users. So you want to encrypt the content so that only um, permitted users will be able to decrypt it. So each user is associated with a secret key. So user X has secret key uh, SK sub X, and um, we have an authorized set S of users, and we want to generate an encryption ciphertext with respect to the uh, authorized set. And um, of course, the notion of security that we want, this is standard in, in cryptographic uh, um, uh, constructions, applications, is uh, this notion of collusion resist resilience, so that uh, not only each individual um, unauthorized user cannot decrypt, even if some unauthorized users come together and join all their secret keys together, they still should not be able to decrypt uh, the ciphertext. And um, now the question that we ask, uh, how long should the ciphertext be? So we assume that the authorized set itself is known to everybody. The question is how much additional information we need to add. Um, and there's a trivial solution to just sort of encrypt the content n times, one uh, for each user, and then uh, each user can decrypt its own secret key, and this is fine. Uh, but obviously, we want much better dependence on the, on the size of the authorized set, in particular, or on the, on the number of users. In particular, we want to go all the way down to poly logarithmic in the number of users. Um, and uh, I guess uh, um, actually Elon put it uh, very nicely in his in his introduction. Uh, there's there's a bunch of known solutions, but we actually don't really know of um, I don't know of a solution um, that is provable under a post quantum assumption. In particular, um, so we want to be resilient against quantum attacks, and one of the popular ways to do that is to rely on lattice assumptions, in particular learning with errors. And a lot of problems have been solved in this way. So we were able to show it was possible for the community to show a lot of um, um, advanced cryptographic primitives based on the hardness of the learning with errors problem. And somehow broadcast encryption doesn't seem very different. Um, and yet we don't really know. Actually, I, I don't know how to do anything sort of uh, uh, better than trivial um, from, from LWE. Um, and this is sort of, um, sort of an outstanding open problem. Maybe this is the sort of the last advanced primitive uh, that we have. Uh, like. Um, short of the regime of obfuscation uh, that we don't know how to construct from, from LWE. Uh, and I should say that you can actually extend this problem and talk about this ciphertext policy ABE, uh, which is essentially the same problem, except instead of an authorized set, you have an authorized policy, like a function F that tells you which user is supposed to decrypt and which user is not supposed to decrypt. Uh, and this is sort of the context that I'm going to talk about. Um, and so Vinod and I were thinking about this thing and how we should be able to do it. And we were sort of putting some stuff together and we came up with a construction. Um, and we thought it was based on LWE and all we need to do is to prove it, but we didn't manage to prove it. And so, and so we said, oh, okay, we sort of led ourselves to believe so many times before that we had a construction for something from LWE and we ended up breaking it. So we tried to break it and we couldn't break it. Um, and it's been a while. And um, you know, we think that it's time for other people to try to either prove it or break it. So uh, this is what we uh, sort of uh, putting forth in, in this work. So it's lattice inspired in the sense that it was inspired by sort of what we know about uh, lattice and LWE based constructions. Um, we don't have a proof of security. Uh, we don't even have like a closed form assumption under which we can prove the, um, um, the security of the scheme. But also we don't, have, we don't have attacks and we also sort of know why the attacks that work in other cases. So why when you try to sort of use similar techniques to construct sort of obfuscation related um, primitives, um, you have some attacks and these attacks don't seem to work here, but really this is, this is sort of all we have. Um, and uh, yeah, so we think that this could be a starting point uh, towards uh, you know, trying to find a proof or trying to find an attack. Uh, there's no reason for this not to be possible to, to do either one. Uh, so let this me is say, similar to how IO started, right? So with a candidate construction, I mean, with uh, no yeah, of reduction started. of proof, and and look what it did. So uh, right, but yeah, but then <laughs> then like there was a there was both I guess attempts to prove and also uh, viable attacks. Here we're kind of at a standstill. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really I mean it's really interesting what is the situation here. Maybe it is like it, it would turn out that broadcast encryption is somehow more similar to um, uh, obfuscation related uh, primitives, even though this is not the case from other assumptions. So really um, curious. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think there's, uh, there's, there's uh, a lot left to be studied here. Uh, let me say just a few words about our technique. So our starting point, so remember I said that what we construct is ciphertext policy attribute based encryption. Uh, and actually, there is a way to construct like sort of the opposite. There's a known way to construct sort of the opposite uh, primitive, which is called key policy attribute-based attribute encryption. So think about this as like the ciphertext is associated with like some identity of a user or something. And um, we 
um, and we give out secret keys that correspond to permitted or not permitted functions. Um, so this can be done uh, uh, succinctly. And what we're trying to do is sort of turn it, turn it over uh, on its head and, and sort of reverse the functionality uh, that, that the scheme gives you without sacrificing succinctness. So you can, you can do it very easily if you sacrifice succinctness, but this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to sort of um, minimize the ciphertext length. So um, very briefly, we're sort of using the structure of the scheme. So essentially um, what we're trying to do is sort of take the decryption, the encryption procedure here. So here the encryption procedure is associated with this value X. And in what we want to construct, we want the secret key to be associated with the, with the identity with the identity X. So what we're trying to do is make a, sort of a generic encryption uh, procedure, which is good for all possible Xs. And then in the decryption, I'm going to give you a secret key that's associated with X that is only going to allow you to sort of recover um, the ciphertext that corresponds to like the, the key policy ciphertext that corresponds to X. And then you will be able to sort of run the, run the decryption. So this is the way that we turn it, uh, we try to turn it on its head. And the structure of this key policy um, um, ABE so it seems very useful for this because it actually doesn't use X. You can think about it as actually not using the identity of X until sort of the last steps. So you generate like two times N ciphertext pieces. And then according to X, you just select one out of each pair. So what we do, so let me sort of skip uh, uh, some of the details that I have here on, here on the slide. What we do when we try to construct ciphertext policy is essentially generate all these two times N pieces and lock each one of them with an individual lock. And we're going to try to generate a secret key for X that will allow you to unlock the pieces that are associated with X. So you're going to be able to recover the correct cipher text, but it shouldn't allow you, um, it shouldn't allow you not just to, to unlock the pieces that you're not supposed to unlock, but remember, we need to be resilient to collusion. So even if we have you know, some different users, each one with an unauthorized uh, secret key, then each one of them can um, you know, um, unlock uh, different pieces, but these pieces are going to be unlocked a different way. So they're not going to be compatible. So if you unlock this piece with one key and this piece with another key, you're not going to be able to put them together. And this is the structure that we're trying to construct. And we're using the linear algebraic structure of these schemes. So essentially the decryption for the key policy ABE should, can be thought of as sort of matrix multiplication on the right. And the unlocking procedure, we're going to generate it as a procedure of uh, uh, multiplying by a vector on the left. So you can do both of these things together. And if you do it many times with many different keys, then you're going to get things that are incompatible. So this is like at a super high level. And yeah, the question is whether it, uh, whether it actually works or not. So this is what I have for you today. Thanks. OK, thank you, Svika. Any questions? Um, so I would maybe ask, like, uh, so maybe broadcast encryption is like a heavy primitive. Maybe that explains why it's so hard to construct. Like, do we know that it implies something interesting except of encryption? So, so again, it's it's not so heavy. I mean, uh, uh, you can you can do non-trivial things even just not just even based based on bilinear maps, uh, which is not like an extraordinary. Okay, I guess it depends who you ask, but it's it's yeah. it's possibly not an extraordinary assumption. So. Uh, I mean, I mean, even getting just like a polynomial improvement uh, is something that we don't know out of lattices. So I don't know if, if you can sort of say generically that broadcast encryption is a hard problem. Maybe it's somehow incompatible with what we know how to do from lattices. This is sort of more like what's going on here, although, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, from bilinear maps, we know how to do like uh, snogs and stuff like that. And, uh, and this is also something we do not know how to do from lattices, right? Uh, so maybe. Okay, yeah, yeah I, if, I, the, is, if there's a connection or not, I, I don't know, I don't know how. Okay. On top of that, there's the, this recent bilinear maps plus LWE based stuff related to broadcast encryption. And again, there, there they seem to be making some sort of knowledge assumption on the bilinear maps related to SNARGs, right? So it does feel somehow like far away in that sense. Yeah, okay, I mean, I can I can say that the that construction that uh, Alex was uh, was alluding to by um, uh, Agarwal uh, and uh, Yamada and Wix, I guess um, it actually uses like a similar structure, except this instead of multiplying on the left, they're multiplying on the left in the exponent of a bilinear group, and uh, this this allows you to actually sort of get uh, get a provable get a provable construction, which is sort of a very uh, very nice way of using bilinear maps. I thought. Okay, Tvika.
thank you. We have uh, one minute of our time, so we're just gonna move on. So our next speaker is Alex, and um, he's gonna talk about correlation tractable hash functions, and this is also with Vinod. Um, and uh, Alex, you want? Okay, uh, you can see the slide. Okay. Uh, hey everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, I'll be talking about this joint work with Vinod on correlation intractable hash functions via shift hiding. So what is correlation intractability? Uh, it's a very general purpose security property of a hash function or hash function family. Uh, you can think of it as being parameterized by a relation R, which takes two, which takes, sorry, T inputs, X1 through XT, along with T corresponding outputs, Y1 through YT. That's, that's what the relation R is. And uh, a hash function family H is correlation intractable for R. If it is computationally difficult to find an R correlation in this hash function, meaning it's hard to come up with inputs X1 through XT, such that X1 through XT and Y1 through YT satisfy the relation where YI is equal to hash of XI. So that, it's in that sense that the, you have a correlation inside the hash function. Uh, so this is an extremely broad security property. Uh, and for the most part, we do not know how to instantiate this based on a standard cryptographic assumption. Uh, like in, uh, in many cases, a random oracle will satisfy this property as long as R satisfies the correct notion of sparsity. But using an actual hash family, we don't know too much. So we do know something if you limit the scope extremely in two different ways. Uh, if you set T to be one and you set relations to be functions, then we know something. So in this very special case, we're just saying uh, you know, we have correlation intractability for functions, which means that it's difficult to find a single input X such that hash of X equals F of X where F is some pre-specified function. Uh, so this, we know how to build from recent work. We know how to build it from standard assumptions in particular uh, due to this work of Pikert and Sheehan, we know how to do it based on just the plain learning with errors assumption. So this is, this is what we know. Uh, I should also mention that you know collision resistance is a special case of the more general correlation intractability definition, and somehow these two examples sort of describe everything that we know for the most part uh, about the general definition. Okay, so that's correlation intractability. Uh, so why do we care? Uh, so there are a few reasons to care. Uh, in the single input case. Uh, correlation intractability turns out to be very closely tied to instantiating what's called the fiat Tremere heuristic in the standard model. Fiat Tremere heuristic is a methodology for building non-interactive argument systems from interactive proofs or interactive arguments even. Uh, and there is this very nice line of work from the last few years that has done two things. It has reduced instantiating fiat Tremere to various special cases of correlation and tractability. And then two, it has built the sufficient correlation and tractability for those applications. And this has resulted in a bunch of nice non-interactive protocols. So that's for the single input case. Uh, in the multi-input case, uh, I would say that things are quite less well studied, but there are a few applications, pretty intriguing applications that people already know about. Uh, just quickly, you know, it, it seems related to building an untrusted common random string, you know, with that, like, by where you have many parties submitting inputs that will contribute to an untrusted CRS. It turns out to be also related to uh, the security of, uh, like, of various MPC protocols. Uh, I have Bitcoin as an example on the slide where, where a form of multi-input correlation and tractability is a necessary, but I mean, not sufficient, but necessary condition for, for a hash function that you use in the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, and finally, there's this very cool work uh, of Ofer, Justin, and Elon recently that uses a form of two-input correlation and tractability to build a very nice computationally like sound error correcting code, which I thought was pretty nice. So these are just a few examples of multi-input correlation and tractability doing something. I expect that there are lots of things that it can do, uh, but it's not very well studied. Uh, so the, the question for this talk is how we build this object. Uh, and, and what we do in this work is we give a new framework for building correlation and tractability by using this other object from crypto, which you know was a priori completely unrelated called shift hiding shiftable functions. 
Uh, this is introduced by Pikert and Xian a few years ago, uh, and they were trying to use it to build constrained PRFs. That was the goal. Uh, and so, so what's, what does our framework do? So first of all, it gives a new construction of single input correlation intractability for functions from LWE. That's extremely simple. The proof is sort of like two lines, so it's very nice. Um, it also allows us to build new flavors of multi-input correlation intractability from LWE, and then even more flavors of, of multi-input correlation intractability, additionally assuming obfuscation. Uh, so yeah, this is roughly speaking what we do. So an example, so here's an example result from that second category. Um, you can consider the following kind of relation, which we, which we called a shifted linear relations. So it's parameterized just by a, a function f, and the relation is a collection of t inputs and outputs, where the outputs, the yi, they add up to the sum of f of xi over all of the inputs. So you know you have the inputs, you evaluate f on them, and the the relation is satisfied if the out if the yeah if the yi sum up to f of xi. So one thing that we can do is build correlation intractable hash functions for this relation. So it's hard to find t inputs whose corresponding hash outputs add up to the sum of f of xi over all i. And uh, we can extend this to, exa for example, also to, to like weighted linear combinations. So, so here, here's an example sort of thing that we can build in the multi-input setting. Um, so the main object that we use to build this stuff is shift hiding shiftable functions. And you should think of this as sort of like a PRF with a programmability property. So, so, uh, so the, the, the syntax is on the slide. And the, so the point is that there should be a way to take your PRF key and output a shifted key depending on some function that sort of shifts the whole evaluation of the PRF by F. So the shifted evaluation of X should always be the real evaluation plus F of X, or at least it should be hard to find an input where this is not true. And then, uh, and then the shifted key should hide the function. So this is the basic object. And before any of this stuff, building correlation and tractability from standard assumptions, we already knew how to build this from LWE. This, this was already known. Um, and so now there's like, so for the like main idea behind what's going on in this paper, and I'll just like show you what it is in the single input setting, it generalizes immediately to the multi input setting. So the key lemma is that a shift hiding shiftable function should just give you correlation and tractability, like as long as it satisfies a minor additional property. So it's a, it's a sort of self reduction for correlation and tractability. So, so the construction is given the shift hiding shiftable function, you should define your hash, hash function to just be a shifted evaluation of this function, uh, yeah, a shifted evaluation on like a trivial constrained key. So it's just, you know, constrained, like it's constrained to shift zero. So it's, it should be matching the act, like the actual PRF. And uh, the claim is that this thing should be correlation intractable for all F provided that the original shift hiding shiftable function is hard to invert at zero. So it's sort of like a one wayness property like that you need to assume in addition to the shift hiding property. And if it holds, then you just get correlation and tractability for free. So this is, yeah, as I was saying, so the shift hiding property just gives you a way to reduce a general kind of correlation and tractability to an extremely simple case. Namely here, the case is literally F being the all zero function. Um, so this raises an interesting question, another interesting question, which has come up before, which is, you know, given just some PRF, uh, imagine that the PRF secret key is actually given out in the clear. Uh, can you say anything about the PRF in particular? Can you say that it's like a one-way function? So this has been studied a little bit in the past and it comes up again here, which I thought was an interesting connection. Um, and so the proof of this lemma is, is, like, is, is trivial. It's tautological, just like, sh just like shift the key and stare at what happens and the proof comes out in two lines. So it's very nice. Um, so then the only thing left to do in the single input case, at least, is then to just you know see if we have uh, an SHSF that actually satisfies this one wayness property, and it turns out that the uh, the construction that was already known actually satisfied this property. So we already had correlation and tractability even before we tried to construct it. It turns out I won't give you the proof here of this one wayness property, it's, but it's it's like a a new like uh, it's a new proof like in a like large family of proofs, just manipulating these BGG plus style homomorphisms. Uh, so I, I think it's a, and uh, so we extend this in order to get multi-input results. We show that this object is also, for example, collision resistant. 
and more generally satisfies this property that it's hard to find a bunch of inputs uh, such that you know when you hash the inputs and take some fixed weighted linear combination that you get zero. This is the like base property that you need. It's sort of it's like a slight generalization of collision resistance, which can then be like lifted to get these F-dependent correlation intractability properties. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, there are a bunch of nice open problems I think that that are you know related to this, namely, can we actually rely on weaker assumptions? Than LWE to get correlation intractability and like exactly like what kinds of multi-input correlation intractability can we really reason about? Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, any questions? Um, okay, so thanks again. That was very interesting, and I would really want to know how we can do multi-input correlation tractable for like a searchable uh, relation, something like we know how to do for one uh, input. I think that would be very nice. Um, that finishes up our session, and uh, there's another session that just start, started two minutes ago in room B. You're all welcome. And uh, there's another crypto session tomorrow for all the crypto people. So I hope to see you there. Bye, guys.